tena tatau i te aroha ki o tatau reo e rangi tāmiro nei a tatau iro te te wāne Nō reira he mihi potono aiho ki a poutou he mihi potono huki ki a tatau i hana mai nei tapiti ki te whakatutuki i te reo karana o te wā E ngā hua aloha ki i mi nei wau i kekahi hua hua olelo e hiki iaku te hoa puka a kā ao re e hiki E ia kā kou nga maka ola o ka po e i hala e hoa o nei e hoa o kou i ka lākou i mūmu e ai ka ola mau ana a ka ola mau ana o ka mea o ka ole o mākua hine o ia ke kumu i hiki mai e i mākau mā wai no o oku no laila aloha kākau apau The subject says, Te Pakarite, i te kokanga, o te reo o Hawaii me te reo Māori. Ke hoa alike ana, o ka holo mua ana, o ka ore lo makua hine, me ka ore lo Māori. While I find such comparisons odious, it is probably an exercise worth attempting, if for the inevitable mutual backslapping that will undoubtedly ensue. Were we not to slap our own backs for the sustained and uncompromising stance adopted by the committed, dedicated few with regard to our languages over these 30 plus years, then who would do it? So allow and indulge me a lover of both languages to saunter down my own memory lane while I am capable of, while I am still capable of doing so, and to thereby come to some conclusion apropos the proposition posed. For who knows what the fates have in store for one Timoti Kaarito. Late in 1980, some 25 members of the Whareiwānanga Waikato Kapahaka and I, along with our kaumātua, the late John De Rangihanyu Niwarangiho, made landfall in Hawaii. On our way home from Tahiti and Los Angeles, where we had enjoyed Christmas with Dr. Parehopa in her home in Orange County, we were billeted in Kalapana by the Hawaiian family and their many friends who had been billeted by us in Aotearoa some 18 months or so prior to our visit to Hawaii. Their principal focus was anything but language. They had come to see how geothermal activity could be harnessed for the use of man since such an idea was being mooted in that part of Kamuku Okeabe at the time. Prior to the visit of this group, the Rangiho had invited four young Hawaiians to come to Aotearoa to see how the Māori world was doing in the field of the arts, politics and agriculture. Those chosen to represent Hawaii on that occasion were Frank Hewitt, Kunani Nihipali, Walter Ritty and Tavihi Raira. A more disparate and incompatible quartet, politically, culturally and socially, would be difficult to encounter. But there they were, this motley crew, with Frank and Punani staying with me, and Walter and Kabehi staying with Terangiho. So we arrived in Hawaii having made these acquaintances, some quite tenuous and others somewhat stronger. All in all, it was a heady experience for many of the students, who were introduced to, in my dinosaur opinion, the very questionable joys of Pakalolo, particularly in Kalabana. <laughs> although Honolulu did not seem to be so bereft in that regard. I thought it a rather poor reason for weaving a taut familial chain, but then each generation finds its own rationale for its codes of acceptable social behaviour. In Honolulu, we were billeted by Kalani Akana and many of his friends from Kapaahula. I had met Kalani and the Hawaiian contingent in Papua New Guinea earlier in that year of 1980 at the South Pacific Arts Festival. I was part of the Māori contingent at that festival, and so it was to be the forerunner of many exchanges and many friendships, some of which have been sustained right up until this day, while others have not stood up to the rigours of time and circumstance, as we become forever busier with our own immediate concerns and less about the plight of others. It was while we were on the Big Island that I was introduced to one Peter Wilson, who gave me a guided tour of the campus, 
it was a lightning quick tour, with nothing to indicate from this cursory meeting that our paths would continue to cross for the next 30 or so years. I had mentioned on pass on to him that I was eligible to take a year's sabbatical leave from the University of Waikato some two years later, and that I had this vague notion of spending it at the University of Hawaii, with no particular campus mentioned. Armed only with my curiosity and my desire to learn Hawaiian, I arrived in Hawaii in June 1982. I had by now thought of a project I might try to pursue during my 12 month sojourn in Hawaii and accordingly set about things with a vengeance. I felt quite strongly that for me to have any credibility with the Hawaiian people I was hoping to speak to, that I should first of all set about trying to learn the language. And so, naivety and high aspiration met in a head-on collision with patience and forbearance. Fortunately for me, but not so much for my Hawaiian counterparts. The topic I had selected for study was, is hula playing a major role in the survival of the Hawaiian language? Knowing full well that such was not the case among the Hakka fraternity, I was eager to see how the Hawaiian situation compared. The Whariwano Waikato Kapa Haka was one of the very few groups extant at the time where the language of the tutor was Maori only, and such had been the case since its inception in 1976, with no quarter given to those who wished to join, but had no language themselves. They joined the group knowing full well what the philosophy of the group was and found their own ways of coping, or they moved on to fresh fields and pastures new. Having found accommodation for myself in Honolulu, I headed for the wilds of Hilo, where I stayed initially with Jerry Johnson, a teacher at the Hilo campus, and his family, who had come to Aotearoa with the people of Kalapana. I was only there a few days when Pina came around to visit and to invite me to stay with him in Kauanui, much to the relief of Jerry and family, and very much to the regret of Pila and Kauanui. <laughs> here then began my Hawaiian language journey at 2894 Pulima Drive, Hilo, Hawaii 96720, <laughs> with a very rudimentary tatty form of Nakayewari as my text. I am so glad that this text was, has now seen the light of day in a more attractive format and is available to all who would wish to have it and to learn from it. In my own autographed copy from the author is the inscription. A little excessive, I think, but nonetheless very flattering and very much appreciated. I may need to read part of it, the most important part. Ka oi o ka uhaumana. Na u na pila. We, my ever patient tutor and I, spent innumerable hours at night debating the inconsistencies of Hawaiian grammar as opposed to the logic of Maori grammar. And so it went on for the next six weeks or so. My first day in class at the university was with the beginners, but because my tutor found me to be a thorn in his side, the next day I was placed in a fourth year class as a penance, and that is where I remained until I left Hilo. By now, I realised that I was not so compatible as a house guest, and that I must be driving my host slowly but very surely up the wall. Having come to that momentous decision, I left Hilo and returned to my apartment into the more beckoning delights of Honolulu. I have had a love-hate relationship with Hilo ever since. And so I am somewhat intrigued by the following words of a mele. Kaua i ka nani o Hilo. A o Hilo. I ka pehi a mau a kaua. The first line I find to be untrue. And the second line to be very true. Assuming, of course, that there are degrees of truth. My language education was not only confined to my immediate tutor, but to his circle of friends who all in their own way contributed and continued to contribute, continued to, contribute to my language education. Many of these people are unaware of the depth and breadth of knowledge they have conveyed to me over these many years. But here, before all of you, I accord them my most sincere gratitude for their patience and tolerance, but more so for the warmth of their undying friendship. Once back in Honolulu, I came under the mantle of Larry, who was introduced to me at Tanikapila of that year, along with his uncle, Yokepa, to whom we all referred very deferentially and reverentially as Anakala. Larry and Anakala will always have a place in my heart.
The heaven was always open to me. <clears throat> the heaven was always open to me, as were the homes of many others. Anakala bore bravely and stoically the pain emanating from my murdering of his beautiful language. Moi mai rai koro, ito moi noro. A kong aro koi te chiro hanga kumpi, te mahara tiutori, tiutori. Rest in peace, dear old man. Even though you're no longer with us, the memories live on. One could not have had a better collection of tutors than those to whom I was exposed when I first set about learning. I had, in my opinion, the veritable cream of the crop, who continues to ensure that I do not mangle unnecessarily. Once having realised that Maori and Hawaiian grammar have more points of coincidence than points of great difference, I was on my way with an occasional, with an occasional nudging from my tutors because of using a Maori structure when I found the Hawaiian one elusive. Most times it seemed to work. <laughs> After all that learning and expenditure of time and energy, only one of the people interviewed opted to speak in Hawaiian. All others feeling they could not express themselves adequately in Hawaiian. It became evident early in the piece that the language and hula were miles apart, even though Hawaiian, like Maori, needs a text to perform to. Fortunately for me, many of the kumuhula of the time were prepared to sit and discuss the thoughts, as well as answer the inane, asinine queries of someone quite unfamiliar with culture. Kumuhula were almost deified by their homana, the authority of decisions never to be opposed or questioned. They were ruthless and peremptory in their dismissal of homana should any transgress, no matter the definition of the transgression. The authority, as I saw it in some instances, seemed to them to pervade even the private behaviour of their charges. My immediate reaction was that such an attitude would not be countenanced by Kapahuna people, by Kapahaka people, and it was an issue I discussed with many of the homana who made a part of my sample. Truly interesting beings. Kumuhula. The language situation that pertained in 1982 is certainly not that which pertains in 2014. There's a great deal more Hawaiian spoken by the Kumuhula, Haumana, dedicated young parents, and those who really care. All auguries well worth the celebrating. These are the results of Punana Leo and Kulakaya Puni along with Kula Nui, the sum total of all those organisations who have a language focus. I was in Honolulu in 1982 when Dr. Tamati Reedy and Dr. Edita Tafigirangi preached the gospel of Kohamareo, or Punanaleo as it became known here in Hawaii. I am often credited with its introduction to Hawaii, but let me state categorically that it was not I. However, since the introduction of Punanaleo and all the other initiatives which have come about as a consequence, no other Maori has had as much to do with the Hawaiian language as one, Timothy Kaitu. Initiatives such as that pertaining in the home of Peel and Kohenmoy while I was with, there with them might seem to be extreme, but extreme circumstances demand extreme remedies. English was forbidden in the house, so all visitors had to speak in Hawaiian, and fortunately for me, there was Hulido, the son of about 18 months at the time, also learning to speak. So we conducted our, once, our simple word conversations and his command of vocabulary became mine. Hulido is one of the first of this new native-speaking generation of Hawaiian, principally because his parents cared that the language should be spoken and retained at all costs. I salute all the parents of that era who shared and realised the same vision, thus guaranteeing the survival of the language into another generation. Both our, both our cultures continued to hula and haka, with these elements providing a springboard for those wishing to move on to a greater comprehension of what they sing and dance about. No language knowledge means a robotic performance where the heart and soul are not fully engaged, but where the mind is constantly trying to recall the next move or the next line of lyrics. It is apparent from the performance how much, how much of it emanates from the mind rather than the soul, because the performance is lacklustre and altogether rather boring pretty to behold, but vacuous in essence. There's no doubt in my mind that we have both made great strides in the, in the retention and vitalization of our languages 
with our numbers, this is the Maori numbers, hovering somewhere between 125 and 200,000 speakers, depending on who's doing the counting. They enjoy a higher profile than ever before, but I still have my concerns. Any student of language will only have as good a command of that language as his or her tutors or the community in which he or she was raised. In the Maori case, and I'm sure that it equally applies to the Hawaiian situation, we need constantly to remind our tutors of the very heavy duty that is theirs. The function of the powers that be is to ensure that the command of the tutors is broad and direct and that steps are taken to allow the tutors to be so. Constant criticism will get us nowhere. For criticism is easy, but where is the solution offered to counter the criticism? Indifferent, incorrect and unimaginative language from, from a tutor guarantees that the command of the student will be equally indifferent, incorrect and unimaginative. Let us give our tutors all the help that is needed to guarantee the transmission of good Hawaiian and Maori, or Maori language. Our Minister of Education, a former student of mine in Parihuyas, um, is bragging about the fact that some $360 million or so will be added to the already high budget for education. I think $100 million of that amount spent on our teachers will do much to raise the standard of language and performance in the classroom. Crucial to all this is the training teachers receive prior to entering the classroom, along with the caliber of person presenting themselves for the teaching profession. What we demand of teachers in the classroom must be equally demanded of those doing the training. Along with pedagogy, it's the insistence that the command of language and culture be beyond criticism in terms of its correct and broad usage, as well as its application in an ever-changing world. The greatest battle we both face is the general apathy of our people, who pay lip service to the importance of language, but do nothing to learn or improve their own command. They want their children to be exposed, but become concerned once when there is the perception that the child might be becoming too Hawaiian or too Maori, and so they are removed from the, from the immersion context and placed back where English is a dominant language. This, the generation here and in Aotearoa that fought so hard for the few gains we had are aging and becoming tired. But the younger generation, which never had to fight those battles, does not exhibit or appear to have the same thirst or hunger. We have handed the language to them on a platter, and all they have had to do is take. So this taking generation continues to take, but will it in due course be able to give? This current generation is now becoming parents, with their children also being exposed to the language, a very salutary fact. But will this generation of children maintain, sustain, retain and continue to expand the, domain, the, the domains of the language? Even more pertinent, will the generation following them be speakers and carers of the language? Some ten years ago, I cast a very critical look at people graduating from houses of learning, along with cocking an equally critical ear at the command of the language. In many respects it was fine, but I found there to be elements of the language uncovered by the institutions of learning. The greatest deficit was colloquial idiomatic language as employed by native speakers when speaking freely among themselves. And the more formal, learned, learned turn of phrase needed by those aspiring to the oratorical benches of their own marae on the part of the men, and the equally formal command of language needed by the women to be able to welcome guests onto their marae. Karanga and Faikorero have been uh, Karanga and Faikorero have been cultural imperatives. It was from this need that the Panikere Tangotere term the Institute of Excellence in the Maori language was founded. Preference was given to those who already had a high level of command, whether native or second speaker, second language learner, and that has remained the principal criterion for anyone wishing to attend. This was the method employed to select the first intake and since then, selection is based on the recommendation of someone who has successfully completed the course or whom one of the teachers has met and considers to be worthy, to be a worthy applicant. Entry is by recommendation and invitation only, with the three tutors and, the three and their assistants having the final say. There is no entry by application. Over this period of time, we have graduated some 300 people, graduated in inverted commas, some 300 people from many of whom are assuming the position of their elders on the marae and have the blessing of the elders in that regard. 
It is difficult in some circumstances for the older generation to admit that it does not have the cultural wherewithal to fulfill the role expected of it. There is now a generation of elders that neither speaks the language with any degree of fluency, nor has a good knowledge of protocol and etiquette for the more formal occasions. It is the deprived generation, the children of those beaten and forbidden to speak the language at school, and to those parents who opted not to teach or, or abdicated that responsibly, depending on your own sense of cynicism. Such is the legacy bequeathed to us both, and which we must seek to overcome rather than just lamenting the fact. The Panikiritanga is a move in that direction, and many of the tribes are now holding seminar in Wānana to teach the traditional chants, etiquette and language of their own people. Those tribes still fortunate enough to have the elders with that knowledge are indeed fortunate. But for many, there is a dearth of, of such knowledgeable experts, and so they call on the expertise of people from other tribes. This, in and of itself, is not a bad thing, because a problem shared is a problem solved. Well, up to a point. Inadvertently, or by ending in the opinion of some, we are creating a more conservative, formal cohort of experts, principally because they are better informed and are far more fluent in the language than their parents' generation, and in some instances, their grandparents' generation. This newly informed generation becomes more demanding and intolerant of cultural breaches, and it's not resistant to say so in the more formal situations, along with appropriate haka and giddy to drive that point home. By Maori codes of etiquette, that is quite permissible, because people coming onto the Rana should be aware of what is expected and demanded and accept accordingly. Tribal mana and reputation are still important aspects of Maori society in 2014. In some ways, these are not the concerns of you, our Hawaiian cousins. The Hala Ula has its observances and formalities that must be acknowledged and accepted without demur, not unlike the Marae situation. Perhaps it is the Marae counterpart, or is it? In the instance of Hala, it is the Homana who asks for permission to enter, with the Kumu giving that permission. In the Marae situation, it is the women of the host tribe who give permission to guests to enter the Marae, along with the women among the guests acknowledging the permission given by appropriate calls and response. It is only after that exchange of greetings that the men are permitted to speak. From all the foregoing comments, one would come to the conclusion that all is well in the Māori language garden. But all linguists or lovers of language are pragmatists and realise that while major progressive strides have been made, one cannot afford to take one's foot off the accelerator because once we break, we may never gain the same momentum. I would suspect that the situation we're taking here is no different, so let's not let up. I have made the comment that never again will the Māori language be the principal language of the Māori world, despite my heart of hearts wishing that that could be the case. It is destined to be, in fact some must say that it already is, the language of the educated middle class and therefore the language of the elite. It is only so because this is the class that has devoted both the time and the energy to the proposition that the Māori language be retained and spoken everywhere, at all times, by those who wish to. It is a philosophy open to all who would care to endorse it, and it is very much the philosophy of the Panikiritanga Te Reo. As a consequence of our stand and demand for standards, we have had many brickbats and very few bouquets over the past decade, all promulgated by those who envy the very high command of language that these grad students enjoy and exhibit. As Atiban would have it, Ahako Kaitahi, Te Raroto Te Hahaira. Even though we might share a meal together, jealousy is raging inside the person next to you. I also state for all to know that our languages survive because of the efforts of second language learners, not because of native speakers. Certainly, Kohangareo are the brainchild of native speakers with a vision. And it is that vision that the second language learner is doing its utmost to realise and sustain. Despite the many flips to my soul because of the many public Māori occasions when Māori is the only language employed, I still have some concerns. Now, what are they? There is a tendency, a very strong tendency, for English to have a marked influence on the language of this generation, and probably those that follow should we not eradicate it. 
I am prepared to admit that language must change and adapt to survive. But there are many structures within the language that can be employed to convey a contemporary thought. I am ruthless with the Panikiratanga students who do this and offer them alternatives that are culturally and linguistically acceptable. There are occasions where one might have to accept that there is no alternative but to adopt an English structure. But I am of the opinion that they can find that they can and must be kept a minimum, otherwise might just as well speak English and be done with it. I accept that neologisms are a natural part of language development. But when the structures of the language employed by this generation of speaker become more English in form and eventually the norm, then I begin to despair and so they let the battle goes on. Maori language media, print, television and radio perpetrate many horrors in the name of Maori language. Many believe that as long as Maori words are employed, then all is fine. It is the want of media to distort language and to initiate new terms in language to accommodate the requirements. It is when the language is more imaginary than real, than actual, that a major disservice is done, particularly when it is broadcast for all and sundry to hear and to, accept that it, and to accept that it is correct. I have referred to the apathy that threatens the very survival of our languages. Apathy appears to be endemic in Polynesia, with people finding every excuse there is not to commit. I am not prepared to spend the time of day with those who do not care. But should the circle of those who do care, even if it be but a small one, then it is they who will always have my ear. It is a real problem that we both have to face without having those who advocate the making of Maori compulsory. I do not support that theory because, of mo because motivation is to be preferred to compulsion. But even more importantly, why waste the time and energies of a teacher on the reluctant? and the diametrically opposed. Our teachers should be deployed to work with those who care. A great deal of opposition to our languages comes from our own people. Many like to have the cultural aspects of the Hakka competitions throughout the country being very well supported and patronised. That the audience understands little seems immaterial, as is the case with many of the performers themselves. I would opine that the audience attending Mary Monick is of a similar disposition. A further matter of concern is that in a recent poll conducted here in Nautaroa, there were a higher proportion of non-Māori speaking, of non-Māori advocating the greater use of the language than Māori themselves. We seem to have come full circle in this regard. Kua māreo, purakaupapa Māori and whare wānana, as is the case with their Hawaiian counterparts, have done much to stem the tide of language loss. We need to bolster these areas and to ensure that they have the best that is available to feed the language to the new generations coming through. One of the ironies of the Māori situation is that the food people of my generation, all highly educated, opted not to, or neglected to, teach their children the language. Now, if the so-called educated cannot see the point of language retention, then how can we expect the not so well educated to see the point or the use of retaining the language? This is a dilemma well worth debating because many of that generation now want their mobile winner to speak the language and they are actively encouraging their attendance at appropriate institutions of learning. Ah me, the game is homework. Um, and so, as the bird returns to its perch, I return to the theme of this paper. As a consequence of our efforts, the number of speakers has increased and any congratulations on that regard are well deserved. Strategic thinking on our part will guarantee the survival into the years to come, and I hope into the millennia to come. Expend our energies on the motivated and the committed. Invite them to board our canoe, and those who exhibit no desire to do so, let us leave them ashore to the ignorance and misfortune. I have no more tears for the uncaring. I have shed, metaphorically speaking, buckets of tears of frustration, anguish and anger over these many years, and have decided categorically that enough is enough. For nothing comes of wishing and hoping, but much will come from a heart that is passionate and has a hunger for this very little thing we call language. Kei ngā karawa. I ngā mahi ko pahawa i roto i ngā tau, a hako ki a mai tātou ki te kūmaru, kōrero i tōna māmaru. 
na te hihipo na te whakapuno tātou ikau. E kawe tunu nei i runga anoi te tuna mōhio e kore te paku waha e tutuni i te wawata i te mua moe anoa. Engari anoa ma te heke o tōta ma te ako pēra. Kei ngā mumu reo nga kua o ka peha kei rama kaulu hawa hei. Ka po e koa o ka o ola ala o ka ola numa kwa hini. Ka ka wapau e numa nei. Hei kone i whakairi ake i taku kete i tara hawa re. Te ora mai no rā tātou katoa. 